Hallelujah. Welcome back to the channel. I'm so glad you could join us today. Today is our very first Sunday morning service. Hallelujah. Today is also, uh, we are celebrating our one year anniversary of our incorporation. Praise God. Hallelujah. Open with me in your Bibles to Isaiah, the sixth chapter. We are going to be reading verses 1 through 8. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. Say amen when you get there. It's after Psalms, Proverbs. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Father God, I come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord. Holy Spirit, I am completely and totally dependent upon you. I cannot do this without you, Holy Spirit. I ask you to breathe life upon this word. Let me speak your words and your words alone. Open our eyes and our ears and our heart. Open our understanding. Let this seed fall on good ground, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. From time to time, I hear stories from different ones at different meetings or maybe I've seen them on YouTube where people saw God. They saw Jesus. And then they tell, oh, it was such a feeling of love. It was such a feeling of peace. What was the other one? Oh, it was just so beautiful and touching and heartwarming. When people tell me stories like that, I begin to question, are they telling me the truth? Did they really see something? Because I'm going to give you some facts this morning about when you're in the presence of God, about when God reveals himself to you. The title of my message this morning is Answering the Call of God. But before we get to that, let's look at what happens when we are in God's presence. When God reveals himself to us. Number one. You are going to be convicted of your sins. I remember now this is a little bit different. Back in 1991. I was trapped on a front porch with a tornado 20 feet from me. There were five of us on that front porch. And my brother-in-law, a combat veteran, said, guys, just close your eyes. I closed my eyes, I knew that that meant we were surely going to die. And I began to repent of my sins. God, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry, you know. 
And God just flooded me with peace and says, you are repentant. That's what's important. Now, the point is, is when you're in God's presence, there is a conviction of sin. When you are facing death, that's about as close to the presence of God as you're going to get. Um, Acts chapter 237, before we go there, when Isaiah was in God's presence, what did he say? He said, woe is me. For I am undone. There's no hiding your sin. You might do little things here and there. And you might fool me. You might fool your parents. You might fool your co-workers. But you don't ever fool God. God sees right through everything. And as one of my mentors, Pastor Hall, always says, the person that you are when you're all alone that's who you really are. Acts 2.37. It says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Which, of course, Peter told them to repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, when you're in God's presence, your sin is going to be on the surface. And it needs to be dealt with. That's number one. Number two. All this, oh, there was such a feeling of love and peace and security. Uh-uh. If you find yourself in God's presence, there will be fear. There will be trembling. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, it might eventually work out to there was peace and love and joy and all of that, but it's going to start out with some fear and trembling. Um, and it's because God is holy and sin cannot abide in His presence. And you think, you may be one of the most upright and holy people that are walking the face of this earth. But when you're in the presence of God, that's when you see just how filthy you really are. I'm reminded of a story of a woman who, she had the whitest laundry that there was. I'm, I'm trying to remember how this goes. But when she compared it to the sun, she saw just how dingy it was. Everybody wanted to have their whites as white as this lady had hers. But when she was out in the sun, she saw that even with all of that, they were still dingy. Do you know that the Word of God says that our righteousness is like filthy rags before Him? Every time that an angel in the Bible has appeared to someone as an angel, with a few exceptions, they have had to start out by saying, fear not. Because when you're in the presence of true holiness, you realize just what a sinner you really are. Number three, you may end up falling to the earth. You may end up falling on the ground, on your face. Acts 9.3 This is when Paul was converted. Do me a favor. Can you pass me my phone over here, please? And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly, thank you, there uh, shined around about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying, unto him. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So, when that light from heaven shined around about him, he fell to the earth. I was at Bishop Socrates' meeting um, about ten years ago. And I was in the crowd ministering to someone for healing. And I began to feel the anointing flow 
And when I did, I said, as I was laying hands on her, I said, there it is. And when I said, there it is, I heard a thud. It sounded like a sack of potatoes hit the ground. And I turned to see what it was, and there was a young lady that crashed to the ground because the presence of God had entered the room. It was already there, but it was very powerful right there when the anointing for healing was flowing to this lady, and she fell to the ground. Nobody there to catch her either. Um, in John 18.4, we're going to see another example of this. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Because it is hard to stand in the presence of God. How many of you have heard that song, I Can Only Imagine? He says in that one line of that song, he says, Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? Because these are things that happen when you're in the presence of God. You may not be able to speak. You may fall to the ground. You may tremble. You might quake. It's like electricity. Different things happen. There's always a reaction when you come into contact with electricity. Maybe your hair stands on an end. On end. Maybe you shout. Maybe your whole body tenses up. I remember when I was a young man scraping a floor. I did floor covering. And I was in a kitchen floor and they had the pigtail for the stove tied up in a knot with bare wire sticking out and as I was scraping that floor with no AC I was sweating I didn't have a shirt on and I backed into that corner where the stove goes and touched me right on my rear end and sent me flying across the room and these are some things that happen when you come into contact with God's power you cannot be in God's presence without some feeling of his power. And number four, things change. When you are in God's presence, when you come into the presence of God, things change. You know, the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, the best example of this I can give is the Apostle Paul. And I actually, I have to, um, oh, it's not this one. I'm going to have to look one up on my phone because I left, uh, I left uh, part of it out. But number four, things change. Paul on the road to Damascus, Acts 9.19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then Saul certain day, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he was the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? So there was a dramatic change in Paul's life. He was going this way, and now he was going this way. He was there to persecute the church, and now he was there to promote the church. He was tearing down the name of Jesus Christ. Now he began building up the name of Jesus Christ. So there will be a change. Now, the purpose of this was all for the calling of God. Answering the call of God. You come into God's presence almost assuredly before you ever get called. When Isaiah was called, he was already in God's presence. When Paul was called, he was already in God's presence. But there are some things 
that need to be done before you answer the call of God. Number one, you better know who's calling you. Are you calling yourself? Now we are all, all of us are called. All of us are called to preach the gospel. All of us are called to evangelize. All of us are called to do these things. But when God has a specific message that he wants you to bring forth, when God has a specific mission for you, you better know that it's God. Now, this is where I needed this. I'm actually not using from the ninth chapter. We're going to go to Acts chapter 26. Where are we at? 26. And I left this one verse out of here. Acts 26, 14. And when they were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Kick against the pricks. And in verse 15 it says, And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. So know who's calling you. Know who's calling you. Are you calling yourself? Is it your ego calling you? One of my mentors, Dr. Price, he has a saying, Many are called, few are chosen. Some just went. Now it's okay if you just went, but you better be preaching the right gospel if you did. Number two, get right. Isaiah recognized that he was not right. He said, Woe is me, for I am undone. And then the angel took the coal from off the altar and cleansed his lips. Paul in Acts 9.17 Ananias went to Paul kind of reluctantly too because Ananias actually argued with God like you sure about this God? <laughs> of course he's sure he's God Acts 9.17 and 18 <clears throat> and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said brother Saul the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. You have to understand something about baptism. Um, there was a Jewish custom, and it's still today. If someone who is not a Jew converts to Judaism, they are baptized by the rabbi. And this is why the baptism of John was so significant. Because he was telling them that the Messiah was there. Paul had to be baptized as a proselyte would have been. So there has to be change. You have to get right. And number three, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That was one of the things that happened with Saul, who became Paul. Well, Saul, Paul, same name. But he was never referred to as Saul after that day. Luke 24, 49. Jesus says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. I'm not going to go into the rest of that, but where he talks about you, you'll be witnesses. You have to have power to go forth. Today, if you wanted to drive to, say, the Grand Canyon, 
the very first thing you would need to do before you left town would be to fill your car with gas. And you're not just going to have one tank of gas to get all the way to the Grand Canyon. You're going to be making stops along the way and refilling that tank. That's why when the Bible says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. If you were to break that down in the Greek, it would say, Be ye being filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not a one-time thing, folks. The Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, and the power of God are given for us to us for a reason, for a purpose. And when that purpose is used up, we need more. It's not a one-time deal. It is continual. And number four, you need to prepare. When an army is going to war, they don't just take a conscript, put a rifle in his hand, and throw him in the field. He'd be the first casualty. No, they will take them through basic training. Six or eight, well, I don't know what it is. I was not in the military. But they go through basic training. And then after basic training, sometimes before they go into a specific theater of operation, they may go into advanced training. You have to have some training. Before you answer the call of God, there needs to be a time of training. Jesus Christ prepared 30 years for three years of ministry. Today, most ministers prepare three or four years for 30 years of ministry. The Apostle Paul, let's take a look at this, in Galatians 1.15, that man spent three years preparing himself in the deserts of Arabia. Galatians 1.15 But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. He did not just immediately go out. It looks like that when you read the account in the book of Acts. And he may have preached you know, right after that. But he separated himself for three years before he went and did all of his missionary journeys. And thank God for a man like Paul. The man wrote the majority of the New Testament. Hallelujah. And number five, wear your armor. When a soldier today goes into battle, he may wear a Kevlar helmet. He may wear a Kevlar vest, maybe with ceramic plates in it, maybe with iron plates in it. He will wear boots that have great support for his ankles so that he doesn't fall. And he will carry at least one weapon. He may carry many weapons. He may have a rifle. He may have a pistol. He may have a bayonet. He may have a grenade launcher. He may be carrying hand grenades. But he is prepared for battle. Put on your armor. The Bible says in Ephesians 6.10, and we're not going to go read any but this one verse, and I'm closing with this. Finally, or two verses, excuse me. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Our enemy is wild, folks. And we need to be prepared to face him. Because one thing's for sure, when God calls you, the enemy will oppose you. So you need to be prepared in every sense of the way. Folks, today if you have never asked Christ in your heart, or maybe you have and you've slipped away, 
I want to ask you this morning to say a prayer with me. If that's you, I want you to know, folks, that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. One is a place of eternal happiness and joy. And the other is a place of eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth. Bow your heads with me and say this prayer. Father in heaven, be merciful to me, a sinner. I am a sinner, God, and I know that my sin has separated me from you. I'm sorry for my sin, Lord. I know it was my sin that put Christ on the cross. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for my sins. Lord Jesus, I know that you died and rose again from the grave three days later. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and be my soon-coming King. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you said that prayer this morning and you really meant it in your heart, God bless you and welcome to the family and the kingdom of God. You are now my brother or my sister. Hallelujah. The angels in heaven are throwing a party right now for you. The Bible says that the angels of God rejoice over one sinner that comes to repentance. If you haven't done so already, take a moment and subscribe to our channel. Hit the notifications bell so you know when we put out new content. And until we meet again, God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you real soon. Hallelujah.